everyone. Um, so, how do people here have heard of IsraelPalace.com? <laughs> uh, right. So, um, a bit of context to this. Pardon? Uh, oh, a bit of context to this. Um, uh, there was recently um, an, uh, an Israeli military operation in the Gaza Strip, and a number of rockets fired by various groups in the Gaza Strip at parts of Israel, and uh, this um, escalation of violence, um, I got to see a lot of people's opinions on it on my Facebook newsfeed, and uh, it made me a little bit sad. So I wrote a blog post, and um, Ian looked, looked at my blog post, and thought, oh, you know, maybe you should present a, you know, your Simon's peace plan to the humanists, and I thought, peace plan? Like I have anything new to say on this peace plan. Well, I, I, mean, I, I can't give you a peace plan, but I can and I will later uh, endorse someone else's excellent peace plan. Um, but I can also try to clarify um, how we might think about this. Again, I'm, I don't want to tell you what to think, but I might be able to help you, um, uh, you know, figure out how to think about this. And so what I'm going to do is I'm mostly going to give you a history lesson, in a sense. I'm going to try to contextualize your conflict uh, in a way that is useful to you. Um, by looking at its history, uh, at its um, kind of key moments, and I'm going to spend a bit of time with the um, present situation, present uh, uh, Dennis Ross's peace plan, and we'll have a talk about it, I hope. So, um, the thing to remember about the Israel-Palestine conflict is that it is really, really long running, uh, over a century, um, about 115 years is probably a good bet as to how long it's been running, but depending on where you want to start, you could perhaps even go as far back as 130. Um, I cannot think of any other conflict that has been going on for so long, in fact. Um, so it has both uh, a regional and, uh, regional and a global context. Um, globally, um, I think it's important to understand European anti-Semitism as having given a powerful uh, impetus both to the origin of the conflict and also uh, in Israeli attitudes as they stand today concerning anti-Semitism and their place in the world. But it also has a regional context in that you can't really separate uh, the, the interactions between Israelis and Palestinians from Israel's uh, um, encounters and security um, dilemmas with its neighbors, with its Arab neighbors. Um, obviously, uh, as I, I hinted at earlier, it's, it's an extremely polarizing subject. Um, and very contentious, and it's worth worth clarifying because of this. And uh, so, to actually have a context for it, um, we need to look at its origins, look at its defining moments, um, look at what has caused it to develop, uh, develop into its current shape, and um, what sort of possibilities for resolution can we realistically consider. So. Some of you may have seen this map. I've seen it. Uh, this map, this map should appear to us on the surface uh, morally troubling. It looks like a conquest to me. Um, so you know, simply taking maps and arraying them like this, this already seems to imply a certain kind of story. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think the story that most people feel it tells is probably a uh, particularly simplistic. One. But, but nevertheless, you know these maps are not inaccurate. This is this is an actual portrayal of, of uh, change in the distribution of land possession between the Jewish and Palestinian communities in the area. Um, really, my goal at the end of this talk is to how do you understand this and, and explain it to anyone. So um, there was a common Zionist slogan: uh, "A land without a people for a people without a land." So obviously, the land didn't have a people. Who were they? Uh, well, um, what would now what is now Israel and Palestine was originally um, part of the Ottoman province of Syria, and um, uh, setting the stage for some of the you know future troubles was uh, were um, reforms that the Ottoman Empire put in place that led to changes in how uh, how land was owned legally and how it could be sold. So I'll mention that a little bit later, and that uh, there were. Uh, small uh, but old Jewish communities, um, notably in Jerusalem and Hebron. And eventually it would become um, the British Mandate of Palestine, 
and the French mandate uh, for uh, Syria and Lebanon. And um, again, the, the dynamics of uh, uh, British mandatory authorities and their interactions with uh, the Jewish and Arab community is really important for understanding kind of how things, what set the stage for how things are now. Okay, uh, whereas the birth of the Zionist movement lies in the very, um, uh, the very toxic and violent anti-Semitism that mostly Eastern European Jews faced in an area which is now Poland called the Pale of Settlement, where they were forced to settle and did not assimilate well. Uh, during during their, their uh, uh, residence in the Pale of Settlement, they suffered many pogroms and other sorts of things. And so, um, so the, the first waves of, re uh, of, of immigrants from elsewhere to Palestine, from Europe to Palestine, uh, were uh, the first wave were essentially refugees. Um, after after that, um, in encounter with uh, ideas about nationalism uh, and and socialism, uh, middle class Eastern European intellectuals comprise the next couple of waves. And it's these people that establish modern Hebrew as um, a language and the kind of iconic kibbutz, the sort of um, communal farming um, uh, enterprise as as the symbol of Israel for quite some time. And uh, there was this idea that they had called uh, Jewish labor, that um, they call it the conquest of land and the conquest of labor. But um, uh, you know, don't be distracted by the bellicosity of, of the word conquest. The idea behind Jewish labor was that only if Jews learn to do everything for themselves can they truly feel as though they own a um, um, country, that, that uh, you know, they, they, they've not purchased um, help, they've kind of it, it basically self-actualized. Um, so so that, that, was the, that was the ideology of the um, second and third aliot, the second and third wave of immigrants. But the fourth wave were not so ideological. They were, again, refugees, uh, in a sense, um, shopkeepers, uh, Eastern European, and um, didn't share the, uh, the sentiments of uh, the labor Zionist movement. And, the counterpoint that they provided to it, revisionist Zionism, um, continues to this day to be, um, well, it's actually, I would say, uh, the most dominant ideology in Israel um, compared to labor Zionism. Netanyahu is a uh, you know, revisionist Zionist. Ariel Sharon coming from this, this background. And revisionist Zionists would eventually form a number of, kind of terrorist groups and militias that uh, I will mention presently. Um, so, under the British mandate, um, there was um, an uneasy coexistence between the uh, Jewish and Arab communities, and actually quite a lot of competition and conflict. So, as the Jewish community grew, um, it, uh, um, the World Zionist Organization and the Jewish National Fund was able to um, secure a lot of land. And often the case would be that um, you know some immigrants come over and say to some Palestinian farmers, "Well, we bought this land." Uh, did you buy it from? We bought it from absentee landlords who own your land in uh, you know, Beirut, Jerusalem, Damascus. Uh, well, this, these are, this is the product of these land reforms that took place a century earlier where um, you know, people who live in the land for generations ceased to own it legally. Um, and uh, the Jews were very encouraged at this time because they had the British support for a uh, national homeland, the Balfour Declaration. Um, conflict increased. There were um, uh, a number of ins uh, incitements of violence and massacres, and this this was a real cause for the militarization of the uh, Jewish community, uh, the Yishu, as it was called, um, particularly uh, the 1929 Palestine riots, which led to the um, destruction of the Hebron Jewish community. Um, it does seem as though these massacres were mostly one-sided, but I don't want to understate the extent to which the growing um, Jewish community was a, you know, an economic and, and national threat to uh, uh, the Arab community. Like, I would have been pretty worried if I, and anxious if I were uh, a Palestinian Arab at the time, too. Um, and that, in fact, the Arabs, um, Arab community eventually engaged in full-on revolt against uh, British authorities and the Jewish community um, because they wanted to state. Uh, and so from 1936 to 1939, uh, this was the real birth of Palestinian nationalism. And a lot of um, Arab uh, hamulas or kind of clan groups engaged in 
rule uh, guerrilla warfare against British and Jewish targets. Um, so the Jewish community, which had very, a very a good intelligence network, they had a good finger on the pulse of the, of the area, provided both information and personnel to the British. Um, and you can, in this picture is of uh, a special night squad, which was a uh, joint British and Jewish um, kind of militarized police detachment. Um, and uh, these special night squads would basically set the doctrine that the IDF even uses today for its um, for a lot of its military and special forces. So uh, yes, you know, the, it wasn't solely altruistic this Jewish help. It actually um, seriously uh, increased the military capacity of the Jewish community, which is significant. Uh, but in the aftermath, um, the the British decided to limit Jewish immigration and also to kind of retool their original promise for a Jewish national state into one of a binational, proportionally representative state, um, which would be very displeasing to the Jews, at least, and it was. Um, but um, the war, Second World War broke out, and so during its initial half, the Jewish community did not want to trouble the British. Uh, they wanted to support the war effort, and they did. And there's a, you know, a kind of a famous, I, I think it was Ben Gurion who said it, but don't quote me, um, although I am quoting someone, um, which is, uh, pardon, I forget, which is, we'll fight the war as if there's no white paper. We'll fight the white paper as if there's no war. Um, and at the same time, uh, Arab nationalism has really, has really died down because Arab nationalist leaders have been expelled during the Arab revolt, and um, they've gone at, it would seem that some of them had allied themselves with um, the Axis in the hopes that the Axis would come and take the region and give them a state. So there are some great pictures of the uh, Haji Amin al Husseini, one of the major uh, national leaders, um, having tea with Hitler and saluting the SS and stuff. Uh, very bad imagery, I would say, but uh, again, it should be contextualized. Um, but by 1942, um, the, the growing realization by the Palestinian Jews that uh, some major catastrophe was happening and uh, the, the failure of British authorities to uh, well, I would say actually rather that their success in stopping immigration um, led to a, a full out revolt. So, two groups, the uh, Irgun, Zwaya Leomi, Irgun and uh, Lehi, had, um, these were associated with the revisionist Zionist movement, and they continued to uh, attack both Arabs and the British without really ceasing. Um, but the Haganah, which was the more labor Zionist official Jewish self defense force, had joined in with them and was attacking British targets. Um, after the war was over, things really, really exploded, um, including the King David Hotel, uh, when uh, Irgun managed to smuggle a lot of explosives into it. So the King David Hotel was um, British HQ of Palestine, military HQ, and uh, it didn't take long before uh, the British had just tired of the whole situation. Uh, you know, the era of, of uh, colonial or imperial control was over, so they turned it over to the UN. And uh, so the UN um, issued a resolution for partition. Uh, the Jews accepted, um, why not? It's more than they had. Uh, the Arabs did not, because it was far less than what they currently had. And the civil war broke out, which the Arabs lost badly. Um, not particularly surprising, because the Jewish community was far more militarily competent and better equipped. Uh, and this is where uh, the Palestinian refugee problem really has its origins. There's an excellent um, excellent um, discussion of this, a very credible one by Benny Morris, worth checking out. But basically, what appears to have happened um, is there were a couple raising of villages, a couple massacres, but for the most part, it was fear and terrible rumors that drove people to uh, flee in, in, in fear. Uh, there's, there's a narrative that, uh, that um, sort of the official party line of Israel, which is, oh, um, no, other Arab countries told the Arabs to leave, said, oh, we'll take over Israel, and you can come back afterwards, and so they left voluntarily. This may have happened in a couple cases, but it's not, um, it's not actually what happened for the most part. And there's a, a Palestinian narrative, which is, oh, it was all about um, widespread massacre and destruction of villages. Again, this happened in some cases. Wasn't, wasn't the dominant um, uh, force. But, I mean, fear is fear. I mean, you're afraid for your lives, and the less you're found, of course you're going to leave. Um, and these refugees weren't allowed back. Um, 
when uh, Israel established the um, state in a kind of declaration and formed the IDF uh, and had driven out a lot of its Arab inhabitants, the surrounding Arab states attacked and lost very soundly. Uh, again, there's a kind of David and Goliath narrative that people like to tell here where the small Israel faces many Arab armies. Um, it's through the Arabs that numbered the uh, Israeli forces. I think it was about 120,000 uh, to 144,000. And of that 120,000, a lot of people were, were like middle-aged women driving trucks kind of things. But uh, the IDF was highly mechanized and could move from battle to battle. Uh, so, um, you know, Middle-aged uh, women driving trucks, sort of thing. What do you mean, sort of thing? <laughs> you know, we're not talking about a bunch of um, uh, aggressive, fit, well-equipped young men just, um, you know, uh, antsy to go in and spill the blood of their their foe. We're talking about a, a desperate community in its entirety mobilized in defense. Uh, but nevertheless, it, they managed to uh, outnumber uncoordinated, uh, uncoordinated Arab forces in, in most battles. So this was a real military success, and not a particularly surprising one to any military uh, commentator at the time. So here we have, we can see some sense of where the first three panels of that map come into place. So this is obviously before, um, before the UN partition plan. Um, this was the UN partition plan. You can see why the Palestinian Arabs were not keen on it in terms of the, the change in the distribution of land that it produced. Although it is important to remember that like nobody lives here. This is desert. Um, nevertheless, um, that is a major shift. And by 1949, the armistice lines were drawn, and it was a pretty significant uh, loss of territory, even considering the um, partition plan. But you can also see why there may have been uh, a very important military uh, reason why this is not nearly as good as that, uh, in that you could bisect the country very easily um, with such a such a narrow point. Oh, uh, could you kind of, you can't see what it says up above. So you started off with on the uh, Palestinian land, the green. Is that correct? I yeah. See. The green is the Palestinian land. Yeah, and then in the second uh, picture. Okay, so on the far left. Okay, the I white see. areas are the Jewish areas. Yeah. The green areas are the Palestinian areas. In the middle, this is the plan that the UN presented, okay. which the Jews accepted and the Arabs rejected. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, oh. given the much greater amount of white. Uh, and then on the far right, we have um, in 1949 armistice points. Once things were, once the dust settled. But the last one doesn't show what it is today. No, um, and I'll be getting to that. Yeah. Part one. This is part one, yeah. Yes. So during the next little while, we had, um, uh, I wouldn't have called it a particularly hot war, but it certainly wasn't um, a true cessation of hostilities. Just switch mics with the other one up there and turn that one off. That'll probably help for a little bit. It certainly wasn't uh, a true cessation of hostilities. So. Um, you have a uh, Palestinian Fedayim, as they call themselves, which you can you can see on the right hand corner, uh, attacking Israeli settlements from uh, the Gaza Strip and Jordan, and you had Israeli reprisal raids. So this is um, Israel's first special forces unit, which would engage in these counter raids, and uh, that's that unit was disbanded after um, accidentally massacring a bunch of people, um, as they said. Uh, but um, you know, um, Ariel Sharon started the unit, and many of its doctrines carried through. Uh, certainly Ariel Sharon did, unfortunately. Did I say that? Um, anyway, uh, so you have, you have various sorts of um, situations which aren't, which certainly are militarily important in, in a broader sense, but I, I don't want to cover because it doesn't quite uh, pertain to the issue of Palestine conflict. But there was an increasingly imminent um, major Egypt-Israel war, um, increasing bellicosity, and eventually you know, the war happened. Um, so, Egypt blockaded the Straits of Tehran, and that is, um, in legal terms, a casus belli. It means that to do this is a legitimate case for somebody to go to war against you, um, you know, the Green Party. And um, there's also basically uh, most of the Israeli, uh, sorry, most of the Egyptian army had by that point massed on Israel's borders. So there's a pretty good sense that uh, a war was about to break out. 
Uh, but the Israelis were prepared, uh, and they um, demolished the Egyptian Air Force very quickly, and um, ended up um, with a uh, resounding military victory, not only all over the Egyptians, but also over uh, Jordan and Syria, whom the uh, Egyptians had managed to uh, draw into the conflict. So the, when the fighting stops, Israel captures, uh, Israel's captured the Gaza Strip and the Sinai from Egypt. It's captured the West Bank um, and East Jerusalem from Jordan. And we can see uh, uh, Yitzhak Rabin and Moshe Dayan um, kind of walking triumphantly into uh, the old city of Jerusalem in that photo. And it captured the Golan Heights from Syria. So here's before and after part two. Um, the sort of uh, pink fleshy colored parts of the map are all the territory that Israel was able to capture after the, uh, you know, as a result of the Six Day War. Major territorial increase. Um, so uh, Israel began settling the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Um, and the West Bank gave it um, what's called strategic depth. So there was an, a kind of a military, non-ideological reason to settle the West Bank. Um, if you, if you can take a look here, um, the fear that uh, Israeli uh, you know, security establishment would have is that an invading army would come through, bisect the country at its most narrow point, and then mop up both sides. So having extra territory here and also a lot of extra ter territory here would make it uh, uh, make any uh, invading army um, have to traverse quite a lot more territory before it got into Israel proper. So there was a reason. Um, beyond, uh, you know, oh, it's the Holy Land kind of thing. But um, after a few wars uh, and the invasion, occupation of Lebanon, uh, and a bunch of terrorism and stuff, um, which I will gloss over, uh, we are at uh, 1987 now, and the Palestinian populations in the Gaza Strip and in the West Bank increasingly um, chafing under the fairly unpleasant conditions of occupation and creeping settlement, engage in a spontaneous and initially fairly non-violent uprising. Uh, this is an iconic picture, uh, children throwing rocks at tanks, so not totally non-violent, but um, perhaps not lethally violent, given the, you know, and then, and, and again, this, this photo tells a story, uh, this photo is accurate, um, but the disparity of power depicted here must be contextualized, um, and I keep saying that. Um, but very quickly, the occupation was less grassroots and more uh, coordinated by the Palestine Liberation Organization, which at that time was in Tunis. And it's around this time that Hamas was founded as a resistance movement uh, and a as a competitor to the PLO. When all was said and done, about 2,000 Palestinians were killed, uh, but half by Israeli troops, but the other half as uh, suspected collaborators. There was quite a lot of uh, violence by Palestinians against Palestinians, as a kind of which which you often see in these sort of initial phases of a uh, you know a, an insurgency. Um, there were some Israelis killed, uh, but the PLO also sort of recognized Israel's right to exist along uh, pre-1967 borders, and this set the motion uh, plans for peace talks, um, which were um, the Oslo Accords and the peace process they started. So, uh, in 1993. Um, secret talks between the Palestinians and the Israelis led to some accords. And the, what the accords said is, you've got to start thinking about a two-state solution very soon, and it needs to take you no less than five, or no more than five years to achieve it. Uh, there will be interim Palestinian self-governance, um, which is the establishment of a Palestinian authority, and the withdrawal of Israeli forces from many parts of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And uh, anyway, needless to say, it broke down. Um, for many reasons. First of all, uh, suicide bombings and other acts of terrorism by, um, uh, you know, refusing parties of the Palestinians, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, um, the assassination of Rabin and the ascendance of Netanyahu, who didn't like the peace process anyway, was only too happy to use terrorism as, a, as an excuse to kill it, uh, and the breakdown of security cooperation between the Palestinian Authority and Israel, as kind of uh, a whole bunch of crazy stuff continued to make everyone pessimistic and angry. And uh, this leads into the second intifada. Um, so in 2000, there was a, a summit at Camp David um, in the US. And under the supervision of Clinton, 
Um, and under the leadership of Ehud Barak on the Israeli side and Yasser Arafat on the Palestinian side, um, they tried to hash out uh, an actual two-state uh, settlement, and they failed. Um, the offer from Israel was, was uh, much better than anything that Israel had offered before, but also not good enough, according to the, the Arabs, who um, not only did they reject the offer, but gave no counter-offer. So uh, that was that. And um, popular protests began following a visit to the Temple Mount, which is where the Aqsa Mosque is located in Jerusalem, and is a very sensitive area um, by Ariel Sharon. And uh, the killing of some subsequent protesters um, by uh, Palestinian police. So, uh, a, uh, for about the first two or three months, there were there was a whole series of popular protests. But those very quickly began to shift toward uh, acts of insurgency, uh, military attacks, acts of terrorism by Palestinian nationalist groups associated with a whole host of parties. And um, the Israeli response was to begin a lot of military operations, including uh, reoccupations uh, and fairly um, wholesale assassination of Palestinian activists. So this is sort of taking us into where we are now, which is uh, after about five years of really exhausting violence, um, the Intifada was basically over, and Israel unilaterally evacuated the Gaza Strip, just pulled out everyone. Um, and um, the result was that the Gaza Strip very soon after ended up in Hamas control. So in 2006, um, the PA held elections under very heavy American pressure, uh, and um, to no one's particularly great surprise, Hamas won, um, and then refused to recognize Israel's right to exist or any prior diplomatic commitments, uh, you know, commensurate with its, with its position all along, um, and so everybody boycotts it. Uh, and in 2007, uh, a little civil war took place between Hamas and Fatah, um, with Hamas taking over Gaza and Fatah, the West Bank. So Egypt and Israel um, blockaded the Gaza Strip, and at the time really placed it on a starvation diet, uh, quite literally in many cases. Um, but um, the, and initially, a kind of a, an uneasy truce and ceasefire between Hamas and Israel broke down in the year 2008, uh, leading to Operation Castlet, um, which you can see a, a picture of in the bottom right-hand corner. And um, this was messy and bloody. Uh, those white things you see streaming down, that is white phosphorus. It will give you the most horrible burns imaginable. Uh, you are legally allowed to use it to create smoke screens, but it is utterly illegal as a weapon of war. And um, as we can see, that is a bit close uh, to people for comfort. Um, but consequently, in the operation, there was a more durable ceasefire, which only recently began to break down and, uh, and a relaxation of the blockade. So here we are on the present. What we have is basically a Hamas governed Gaza Strip. Um, with you know, Hamas having a military wing, police, uh, tax collectors is a very important part. If you want to be a government, you've got to collect taxes and um, bureaucracies and these sorts of things. Um, and there is a relaxed but still certainly you know in place blockade, right? I mean, people are moving in and out. Uh, and uh, it's important to understand this as um, what is underlying um, the recent escalation of hostilities between. Hamas and Israel. So for Hamas to actually keep a ceasefire with Israel and to clap down on other groups in the Gaza Strip and keep them from launching rockets is uh, cost them politically because they were a resistance movement. And um, it, making that transition from a resistance movement to a government um, means that they they can no longer benefit from um, the, 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 the rosy glow of being freedom fighters. They have to actually provide good services. and. You know, facing increasing criticism from more bellicose parties in Gaza, saying, "Why aren't you fighting the Israelis?" etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they began to relax that uh, that clampdown of the groups. Uh, and so, what happened was, um, PIJ, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, began launching some rockets, and then Hamas also engaged in some uh, abnormal attacks in Israel. So they used a, a Russian anti-tank missile uh, called the Cornet, and they used um, they, they mined a patrol. So Israel responded. Uh, with far more force than Hamas expected recently by uh, assassinating the head of Hamas military wing, and so we had this exchange of fire, um, which is now over, and hopefully they basically return to the status quo. Um, whereas the uh, Palestinian Authority under Abu Mazen is, is open to a two-state solution, but pessimistic, not engaged with Israel, because 
Israeli settlement activity continues unabated. The Israeli government is not willing to halt it or slow it down for talks. And um, so Abu Mazen feels that he can, he can pursue better, uh, you know, better diplomatic progress at the UN. And so we're left with this stalemate. Um, so here is what we see now. This is the West Bank. Um, these little green puddles, um, some cases larger green puddles, but very puddle-like, are um, Palestinian areas. Uh, the white areas are those under Israeli security control. Uh, so they're not settled, they're just patrolled by the IDF, and it's very difficult for Palestinians to make economic use of them. And the uh, crimson wine-colored areas are actual settlements. And uh, some of those these settlement areas would be transferred to Israel in a... Can you back, read the title of your map there? Um, the map says um, West Bank Access Enclosure, but you know, the salient details are um, the green puddles, the crimson areas representing settlements, and these squalls of white representing Israeli control. So the, the fear is that uh, as settlement activity increases, um, Palestinian areas will sort of shrink into cantonments, and the possibility of a, a single unified Palestinian territory will end. Yeah. Can you show a map with uh, Jerusalem? Are you coming to that? Jerusalem. Yeah, um, I don't have a map of Jerusalem now. I can pull okay. one up later. Yeah. So, um, I do want to address some bad anti-Israel tropes that I run into um, because they bother me a lot, uh, and I feel that they they degrade conversation. Um, so, uh, I don't, I don't know whether any of you will 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 uh, be sympathetic to these, but. There are some worth mentioning. First of all, I don't think it is uh, useful to compare Israel's occupation to apartheid, um, because uh, the situation in Israel was that Israeli Arabs enjoy um, full legal rights and, and political uh, representation, not that they don't face uh, you know discrimination and racism at a, at a social level. And um, in Palestinian territories, you have a, a military bureaucracy, but uh, occupied territories are legally obligated to be administered by militaries. So um, there are points of comparison you can make, like stuff that only, only roads and Palestinian roads and other sorts of things that uh, bear an aesthetic resemblance to apartheid. But I think it's unhelpful to take the idea of apartheid out of the particular uh, context of South Africa, its particular um, geographic and ethnic makeup. Um, something can be bad and, and not be apartheid. So second, uh, the, the wall that many people talk about is about 90% fence, 10% wall. Uh, and I, I believe that it does provide um, uh, a real security benefit. It does appear to keep infiltrators out for the most part. Um, that doesn't mean that it hasn't been abused to uh, kind of serve a settlement agenda or uh, kind of de facto annex areas. And this abuse has been um, uh, criticized by the Israeli Supreme Court. and the, the um, path the barrier takes has been rerouted for this reason, um, but um, uh, it is not officially a border, and the territory uh, that, it, that it encompasses is not um, designed to have any kind of permanence to it. Um, I don't think Israel's actions towards Palestinians are genocidal. Um, the vast majority of Israelis, even those in the fairly far right, don't actually bear to desire uh, a genocide. Um, Israel's blockade of the Gaza Strip has substantially relaxed. So again, no longer a starvation diet. Uh, most goods flow freely, for the most part. Uh, people don't, um, obviously. And also, I often hear the rockets uh, fired by various groups in the Gaza Strip referred to as um, firecrackers. This, this is really not a good way to describe them. They do present a threat. Uh, they do have warheads to explode, uh, most of them. Uh, anyway, um, and uh, if you were to go to the south of Israel, to the area around Sterot, what you would see is portable concrete bomb shelters every 20 paces or so, 30 paces, maybe a little bit longer than that, but all over the place. Uh, second floors of schools or colleges, uh, whatnot, not in use because they're not protected from um, rockets. And uh, people who are very careful to, you know, to not stray too far from a protected area. So. They do kill, they do maim. They don't kill the maim as much as they would if those bomb shelters weren't there. Um, but uh, they, aren't, they aren't harmless. They aren't just symbolic. 
But you know, lest I sound like a mafia lawyer um, defending, defending Israel in these terms, let me make a, a few uh, critical points. There's no reason why Israel, if it wants a two-state solution, should be engaging in settlement activity. The strategic debt argument no longer works because Israel's security threats from its neighbors come in the form of ballistic missiles, not invading armies. Uh, you know, there's, no, there's not going to be an invasion of Israel. There's no bisection of Israel. The West Bank does not provide useful debt. Uh, and at the same time, settlement construction just appears toxic in terms of the message it sends, uh, both to the Palestinians and to Israel's allies. Um, and Palestinians in the West Bank do not receive their rights under international humanitarian law. They do not receive um, uh, adequate bureaucratic and legal treatment, from what I can tell, uh, by, military, by uh, the authorities of military occupation. And also, Israeli politics has displayed a very distressing shift to the right um, in recent times. And uh, sadly, I don't necessarily see that as being um, likely to reverse anytime soon. Okay, so there is one plan that can give us hope, uh, and that is a two-state solution. Uh, we should want this. Um, we should want this because Israel and Palestine are distinct, um, distinct national communities with their own projects and their own aspirations, and we want them to be able to pursue those. Uh, and also, uh, a one-state solution that granted fair representation to both parties would basically be the end of the Israeli state, as Israelis understand it, the end of a Jewish state, and so they'll never, they'll never accept it, so talking about it is basically a red herring, it's not tenable. Um, and uh, to Dennis Ross, who was Bill Clinton's envoy to the peace process and has had a real hand in the, uh, the, the diplomatic uh, situation there since, proposed a peace process that is uh, kind of 12 steps, six for the Israelis, six for the Palestinians, and uh, I encountered this, I, I wasn't aware of this process, but I heard him speak at a, a luncheon for grad students at the U of T, uh, where I'm a student, and then also at a public lecture, and he seemed surprisingly optimistic about the potential for these steps to bring people together and for them to figure out uh, final status issues that are actually, they're mostly worked out, to be honest. It's just a matter of getting people to the table and, and able to sign stuff. And so, Ross says to the Israelis, first, offer compensation, to settlers who begin leaving voluntarily uh, and construct houses for them so that they know they have some place to go. Because uh, the settler movement is very uh, aware of how little support the Israeli state gave to the settlers that they evacuated from the Gaza Strip. Uh, and that, that, that frightens them. And that also makes them deeply mistrustful of any Israeli promises that there will be some kind of resettlement or compensation. So show, you know, uh, show don't tell, in a sense. Uh, and in the areas where Israel will be leading in the final status agreement, stop construction. There are certain small areas of settlement uh, where most of the settlers live, and um, these areas will probably be swapped to Israel in exchange for some Israeli land. Maybe continue construction there, but in areas where they'll definitely be evacuating, no reason to continue. Looks bad faith. And uh, in the areas that we saw earlier, those large white areas, uh, those should be open to Palestinian economic activity. Um, and it shows that Israel will be willing to relinquish security control. Um, the Palestinian police's presence in um, other areas where they police Palestinians but they don't handle security issues, uh, it should be expanded more towards security issues to lower Israel's profile. And in areas where the Palestinian Authority has full civil control, you know, people should not be seeing Israeli soldiers in these areas unless very, very uh, you know, abnormal circumstances uh, come to pass. And Ross says to the Palestinians, you need to do some symbolic things. You need to put Israel on the map. You, know, you need to put Israel in the textbooks. You need to acknowledge uh, a historical Isra uh, a Jewish connection to the land. And uh, you need to stop naming streets uh, and town squares after suicide bombers, because that looks really bad from the Israeli perspective. It makes them very pessimistic. Uh, not everybody who kills an Israeli is a martyr for the Palestinian cause. Uh, and the PA must stop um, presenting itself as being a victim completely deprived of agency. I mean, personally speaking, I believe the Palestinians are a victim, but um, they are not a wholly, wholly disenfranchised at this point. There, there are, uh, the Palestinian Authority does have the capacity to help uh, Palestinians uh, achieve a state, uh, uh, you know, help to achieve an infrastructure, help them to achieve governing institutions. And um, refugee camps remain refugee camps. Now, 
if you're a refugee and somebody comes and says, well, let's, let's build some permanent housing in a refugee camp, that looks bad, right? You're a refugee. You know, you're not there to live permanently. Uh, but the result is that refugee camps are horrible places to be. Uh, and those people are not going back. Um, they're not going back to this world. So turn them into a, like, a permanent settlement. So make, make them actual homes for something. Anyway, some final thoughts. Uh, I focus particularly on security issues and geopolitics because I think these are significant factors and also because they're the things that I know about. Um, and I've also focused on contextualizing Israeli action so that it doesn't look like some kind of you know hideous fascistic uh, you know colonial um, monstrosity, but um, that doesn't mean that it isn't still bad. Like we can understand uh, and, and in some cases understand their actions to be mitigated by the context, but that doesn't make them fully just or fair. I, I would say, um, and so and then also therefore giving you one narrative of history, I've given you one explanation of events. I think it is a useful one. I think it captures important facts and details, but it's not the only narrative. It's not the only set of facts. It's not the only set of details. Um, so we can talk about it. And um, when talking about it, let's try to remember that all of us are making a good faith attempt to try to understand uh, better what's happening and, and find a way out of it. So if we disagree with one another, um, it's not because uh, some people are bad and evil, basically. Anyway, uh, I'm done.